If you would turn to your, uh, your passage, or rather uh, Galatians chapter 5, um, and we will start there in verse 1 and probably not get out of it, but I am going to read the context of it nevertheless. This is Paul. This is a letter of complaint, and we cannot forget that. Paul is unhappy with this group of churches Uh, This is Paul's first letter, probably written the year before uh, the Council of uh, Jerusalem, which was in AD 49, probably written uh, the the letter in AD 48, Um, and Paul is astounded at the people going away from the gospel, and by going away, they're adding to the gospel, and when you add to the gospel, you completely ruin it. You, this is the one thing you don't do. And, and uh, G.I. Williamson has a great illustration of that in his wonderful book on the confession of the West, Westminster Confession of Faith. He says, if you have a wonderful glass of water, though illustrating something else in that tome, uh, and you put just one drop of poison just one in that glass, that, that 10 ounce glass of water. What portion will you drink out of that water to refresh? It's no good at all. And so, too, adding to the gospel destroys it. No addition is acceptable to the gospel. It is what our Lord has done, period. Not what I have done. And that will never change by God's grace. But this is, this is a wonderful thing. It's a great thing. It's great news. You might be interested to know that Paul, so concerned about being accused of antinomianism, anti-law, that this is his final hurrah. These next, these first 12 verses is where he sums up, by and large, the concern over adding to the gospel, don't be doing to be saved, but let what Christ's work has done, what Christ has done for us, he finishes with it. And then, very quickly, he goes, for example, look at 5.13. For you were called to freedom, but now he addresses the other concern. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. So he's attacking two things in this letter of complaint. And the the lion's share is don't add to the gospel. But then quickly in chapter 5 principally, he says, oh, and by the way, freedom in Christ doesn't mean willy-nilly living. It doesn't mean, well, I can do whatever I want to do. It doesn't. And as um, precious Sinclair Ferguson has reminded us in the whole Christ, Um, When Christ enters a life, all of him (laughs) enters. He is Lord as well. And he is now seated on the throne of our lives. So how wonderful that is. Anyway, let's start reading in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. And we'll go to 12 and won't get anywhere close to finishing. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. 
You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, will still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettled you would emasculate themselves. If anybody thinks Paul was a weenie, um, you haven't read um, Ephesians, uh, Philippians chapter 3 correctly or this passage correctly either. Paul was a rough dude. Uh, I mean, he basically, uh, as well as in chapter 1, he wished people were cursed. He said it. If you're not preaching the gospel, if you're preaching a false gospel, I just hope you go to hell. Now, that did not include Paul's desire that they would repent. But if they persisted, if they refused to repent, he didn't have to hope they would go to hell. They were. Um, Anathema means damned by God, essentially. And that's what Paul was saying. Here it's uh, fairly brutal, um, but that's not our point today. That our, our concern is freedom. What is freedom? And let me tell you, dare I say, we Americans, very few of us understand what freedom is. Um, One of the wonderful things about going to those Ole Miss football games, and, and Joe and I sat together yesterday, and Joe has put his life on the line for the freedom of this country, which we are very grateful for. But it, it, it just, to see in the case of yesterday, uh, two men parachute in from the U.S. Army uh, pregame, and for the things that men and women have done uh, to protect our country, and how veterans will sometimes speak up wounded veterans, veterans without legs and arms, and say, I, I'm not recognizing my country. We need, we need to pay attention to their exclamation and say, we, this is not what our understanding of the United States of America is. Freedom is not doing what you want to do. It's freedom from tyranny and freedom to accept your responsibilities. And the same is true in Christ. It's freedom from the tyranny of being under the heavy yoke of the law. But it is not freedom for you to take advantage of people such as the freedom that, that some have felt like they had, such as Jeffrey uh, Epstein and, and the Weinstein fellow and others, Prince Andrew, and uh, to, that, that they were elevated enough and free enough to take advantage of young girls and other women. That's not freedom. That's tyranny. Freedom is often misunderstood But I want to read, and I'd like for you to turn, and this is where I think the value of us having our own Bibles open as opposed to my showing them on the overhead uh, comes in. If you would turn to John chapter 8, verse 31, our Lord himself speaks about freedom. And interestingly, and and, um, quite appropriately, Our Lord is talking to people who say, I am born of Abraham. I know all there is to know about being a people of God. But we'll see whether that was the case or not. This is verse 31 in John chapter 8. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, they they took his word 
f- f- as actual, as, as truthful. But that doesn't mean they were born again. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The truth. They answered him, we are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become become free? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you're the offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. Wow. Our Lord is talking about the fact that I I offer you liberty from yourself and from the law. Now, I was talking to Joe, um, I guess it was yesterday on the way home from the football game, or, or perhaps going to about someone that I've mentioned several times recently and think appropriately, Harriet Tubman. You, you know who she is, right? She was 29 years old. She escaped from her slave master from uh, Maryland, um, not commonly th- regarded as a slave state, but um, she got into Philadelphia and remarkably, she, she started coming back to rescue other slaves. Uh, a woman, I think she was illiterate at the time, and she came back, I think over a dozen times, to rescue other people. And someone was congratulating her years later and admiring her work, and she said, and uh, having saved uh, roughly 300 people from slavery at the time. And she said something very revealing. She said, I could have saved many more. Now listen to her words. If only they had known they were slaves. And you think, how could they not have known? But wasn't it Israel who wanted to go back to Egypt? Even after the Red Sea incident? The Red Sea exodus? The Red Sea redemption? And so the Galatians are doing something very similar. They'd forgotten. Now, they were pagans. And Judaizers, whom they said the brothers from Jerusalem had sent, but they lied. We we know they lied because a year later we have this the first general assembly, if you want to call it that, and I think legitimately so, that condemned the very thing that these men were telling the Galatians that they had to do. They were telling them, you have to submit to circumcision in order to be saved. But there were things that they didn't realize (laughs) that the implications were that they were tying themselves to a law that would tear them apart. But freedom has got to be understood. And the I'll call it point one, is our Lord himself is a being of complete freedom. He cannot offer freedom if he himself is not the author of freedom. I remember uh, when I lived in the tribal area of Mexico, uh, there was this truck that I would frequently see between the, the state capital of Oaxaca and the village that I would frequently go to and lived in at one time called Mitla. 
and it's uh, and I don't know if you've ever seen a Mexican truck, but a Mexican truck loves they love to paint things on, and and they do a good job. But boy, are they colorful. And they sometimes they have Christmas lights on like 18 wheelers, you know, all around the the windshield and everything. But on the front of this guy's truck, it said "Soy quien soy," which means from Exodus 3:14, "I am who I am." And I would every time I'd see that, you know, kind of. Teasingly, I'd say, Lord, don't let that pagan hit me. Because he's taking your name, your title, your, your, your essence in vain. I, I think, um, what's that Canadian singer that sang um, that on the, the Titanic movie? Um, she has an album called I Am Who I Am. Yikes. Celine Dion. Celine Dion, yes. I am who I am. And the reason I say yikes is because there's only one being in the universe who can say that. And that's our Lord. The essence of God is I am who I am. He is the only non-contingent being in the universe. And every single other being is a creature He is not a creature. He is the Creator. He is not contingent upon anyone. He is the only being that exists in Himself without anything else. He is not self-created. He is self-existent. Look at John. Just, Just if you're still in John, look briefly over at John 5.26. Now, this is a verse that is worth underlining or highlighting. John 5.26 says this. I'd give you the Pew Bible, but I'm looking at the massive print Bible, so I don't lose my place. For as the Father has life in Himself, so He has granted the Son also to have life in Himself. Do you hear that mystical existence of the God, in in this case, certainly still three persons, but specifically speaking about the Father and the Son, how that Godhead essence is self-existence And that personal relationship, eternal relationship that the Father has with the Son means the Son likewise has self-existence. Because He is the exact representation of the Father. The problem with our mere human minds is that we think, when did that happen? It didn't when happen. That was terrible English. But do you understand? Our Lord is called the Eternal Father because there was never a time that He was not the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Son. And there's never been a time when our Lord, the Eternal Son, has not been the Eternal Son because the essence of God is... Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we learn this progressively from Genesis 1.1 all the way to Revelation 21.22. We learn of God's essence being Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the Gospel. A precious, precious thing. How do you react to a being that actually has Life in Himself that is not contingent, that He does not depend on anything or anyone. 
and how ridiculous it is to say, even talking about predestination and, and election, well, God knew what we would choose. And it's just like, God, that is just definitely an attack on the very essence of God himself. He doesn't respond like a shortstop to grounders that we hit to him. And he's just such a perfect shortstop, he always makes the throw to first. Our Lord ordains all things whatsoever to come to pass, but has not thereby done violence to his creatures. What a wonderful, wonderful thing. That's where we bury our face into the bosom of our Lord and say, thank you. I'm free in Christ. Free to get a brownie if I want a brownie. Though there are consequences. But our Lord doesn't have us bearing about a yoke. Listen to what Paul said of our Lord in Acts chapter 17. As a matter of fact, why don't we turn there? Because that's very very close to John. Acts chapter 17, verses 24 and 25. It says this, The God who made the world, he's speaking to pagans, The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is He served by human hands as though He needed anything, since He Himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. He gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Some people don't feel very comfortable with the fact that God has all this power over them. And often, I think, dear people that we care for who have a stilted understanding of the gospel feel like they're relinquishing control in a God who has so much power. And that's exactly what they're being called to do. You are being called to recklessly, as it were, cast all of your hope on a God who holds you by the word of his power. Listen to what Thomas Goodwin said. What is the cause of all God's purposes toward us? His one word answer, himself. What is the cause of all God's purposes toward us? Himself. Now aren't you grateful that He is good? (laughs) He is all good. And the Psalms say He only does wonderful things. Do you believe that? When you're going through hell or in the valley like we, we pray, uh, sung about earlier, do you believe that God only, only does wonderful things? You must. Otherwise, you're going to be wearing a yoke of lack of freedom that you're going to have to take care of everything yourself. In Back in Galatians chapter 5, if you would flip back there with me, there is a response that Paul is talking about. And it's a response in verse, verse 1 of chapter 5, for freedom Christ has set us free. It's the purpose that He has called us to Himself. He's responding to the fact of back in chapter 4, Hagar, Sarah, and Abraham concocted a plan to help God out. Sarah was getting pretty old, past the ability to have children. And she had had none, and God had promised that she would. So what 
What plan did Sarah concoct? I've got to help God out with this thing. So, Abraham, here's my servant, Hagar. Lie with her. And we'll have a son through her. That was the exact thing that God is calling us not to do. Don't help him. Paul uses it as an illustration. The the word translated is allegory, but it's not in the term allegory that we tend to think of, as in Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe uh, allegory. But as an illustration from Scripture, it can serve as an example of what not to do. Don't throw in your two cents in terms of your being saved. Verse 26 of chapter 4, that obviously chapter 5 follows, says this, but the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. Not the church, but heaven itself. Heaven is our mother. God is our Father. Galatians 4.31 says this, So brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. We do not have to depend on, as I've mentioned several times, we are not circus poodles jumping through burning hoops to get God to like us. Our Lord Jesus Christ has done that. He proclaims liberty. If you'd like to turn to Isaiah 61, I'll show you that this is the Lord Jesus Christ's commission from the Father in the covenant of grace. Isaiah 61, verse 1 says this, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because Yahweh, the Lord, has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, and what? To proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. In other words, you could characterize our Lord's mission on earth as proclaiming liberty to people who bore very heavy weights on their shoulders. A weight that even in that Jerusalem council in Acts 15, the apostles themselves said, brothers, why would we put a weight that even we ourselves could not bear on the Gentile believers, but concentrate on the gospel? Encourage them to stay away from fornication and from eating blood. That was the gospel message. And the ethic is quite interesting. The implication of the ethic is sexual purity and not eating things sacrificed to demons or the blood of animals. So how do you think a God who is committed to freedom, who he himself is free, How would he regard the person who said, thank you, but no thank you. I'll take care of things myself. I'll do it on my own. I'll worry with these things for myself. I feel internally that this is not proper. I don't buy the Word of God. I don't buy the Gospel. I'll be baptized so that I can be saved. Or I'll do this. I'll take communion so that I can be saved. Or I'll do X or Y or Z so that I can be saved. We learn later in the epistle, as we've learned threaded throughout, that's a burden. That's a difficulty. 
But our Lord says back in Galatians chapter 5, in reference to Hagar, the slave woman, she will be cast out. There's a parallel passage in Matthew chapter 22, and it's quite chilling. If you would turn to Matthew 22, verse 11. Matthew chapter 22, starting in verse 11. It says this. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there was a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Verse 13, Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into outer darkness. Dear ones, nobody likes to hear stuff like that. But the fact is, is that we are born into that. We are born not the people of God. And our Lord has provided a wedding dress for us, wedding garments, wedding attire, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And if we do not appropriate those things, the shed blood of Jesus Christ on our behalf, the the, the righteous living of Jesus Christ on our behalf, then we are twofold the children of the evil one. Why would we do that? Why would we think that we can take care of these things on our own? What does it say to the Lord Himself to say, you know what, the offense of the gospel, yeah, I, I, whatever. I don't accept that these things are necessary. I I can do these things. That's nonsense. John 3.18 says, Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. That's our natural starting point. And part of the offense of the gospel that Paul talks about later in chapter 5 is that we have to say that we are by nature fundamentally wrong and alienated from God. Fundamentally. But, dear ones, I want to remind you, I don't want to finish on that. I want to remind you of what our Lord says in one of the most... Brilliant passages, and I think that Jeremy uh, prayed earlier uh, in reference to this, at least during the prayer time that we had before Sunday school. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30. And if you don't have this underlined, and you do underline in your Bible, this needs to be highlighted, underlined, exclamation mark, your bottom line. Verse 28. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Do you not hear the God of freedom saying to you, I know freedom. I can offer freedom. Freedom like you've never experienced before and I beg you. He's begging in His human nature as it were, and I'm using very human terms and I apologize for that, let me give you life. Let me give you freedom. Take it. Take it. Come to me. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. 
why would you die trying to take care of these things on your own? For freedom, Christ has set us free. Amen. Lord Jesus, we praise you. That for freedom, Christ has set us free. And now we have the freedom in good conscience to take the Lord's Supper. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.